we have to do this. We have to do this. I'm just saying good morning. Good morning. I'm so good glad that you could come. My name is Leslie Collins. I'm the president of the Trail and Tears Association. And Sharon Houseley is our vice president. And she will introduce you to our speaker. Good morning, everybody. We are so lucky that Michael Warren can come and uh, speak with us today. He has researched for many of our states on all of the church removal sites and related church places and um, significant um, people, uh, the shakers and the leaders um, of the Cherokee Nation early in the 1800s and later. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. And he can introduce us to, um, we have with us our National Park Service representatives that do the trails. And I'm going to let him explain um, who's on the line and what they do so we'll all know them. Because we definitely want to restart our program and get our sites certified and get people out there looking at them and, and learning about what we mean in it. And what it would impact on their on their children, families that could still happen today in many ways. So thank you. Good morning. Glad to be here. Uh, I am Mike Wren, a member of the Georgia chapter. I've been for years and years and years. And I'm on the board at one time. I'm now the director of the search for volunteers national. So I'm always involved in the search. So that's, I'm going to start this off today, me, and then we're going to have three people from the National Park Service Trails Office to talk officially about the programs and what, what the opportunities are, uh, and Helica, then Emily, and then Chad. So I'm starting with historical research. Start. So, Glenda the Good Witch of the North told Dorothy Gale, where do you start? It's always best to start at the beginning. So, the beginning is, what is the Trail of Tears Association? Why are we here? Trail of Tears Association, the national nonprofit with a mission to identify, protect, preserve Trail of Tears National Historic Trail Resources and to promote awareness of the trail legacy, including the removal story. Of the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, consistent with the National Park Service's trail rules. Key words to always focus on identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness consistent with the National Park Service's trail plan. So those are each individual things that we do. And the why we do what we do. So this is the Cherokee Nation in Georgia. This is the great map. You can find it on the internet. It's a really good and useful map. Uh, there are 24 counties in Georgia, in whole or in part, which land was the Cherokee Nation in Georgia. 24 counties. Dade, Walker, Chattooga, Floyd, Oak, Harrelson, Alding, Douglas, Bartow, Gordon, Tusa, Whitfield, Murray, Fannin, Gilmer, Pickens, Cherokee, Cobb, Fulton, Forsyth, Dawson, Lumpkin, Union, Towns. Every one of those counties matter. Everywhere matters. You've heard I think Tip O'Neill is usually who is associated with this thing. All politics is local, all history is local. So if you live in Harrelson and Polk and Paulding and Douglas, you may be vaguely interested somewhat in the spring place mission, but you're really going to be interested in well, what Cherokees lived here? What was here? Who was here? What happened here? As an association, including the Georgia chapter, 
you build collaborations, you build local partnerships. County and local historical societies, they're interested locally. The DAR chapters, almost every one of them is interested in local. After any local university or colleges, their history department may have someone who's interested in Georgia history, particularly charity. High school history teachers, particularly if it's an AP teacher, but any of them, they may be interested in, in you go, okay, we're going to come into to your county. Do you have any students who want to come uh, to a meeting? You're going to give them extra credit? I guarantee you they'll get up and come. Get to know the local libraries where we are, particularly if they have a history and genealogy collection. Because people come in there and ask questions all the time. What do you know about the chair? What do you know about what happened here? Particularly North Georgia has lots of people who have moved in who really know nothing about the history. Okay. Get to know the archives and manuscript repositories. Get to know the county officials. There's the people you have to talk to about roads. There's the people that you talk to about historical preservation. There's the people who, if I realize how much resource that you've got, they're going to pick up the phone and call you. Can you help us with this? Identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness. What do you do? Well, what does that include? Roads and miles. Removal fort sites. Cherokee homes. There are still Cherokee homes in Bethany. Ferries. There were very few bridges over any of the roads. There might be bridges over some places, but most of them are really. Saw mills and grist mills, Cherokee um, Stands and taverns that they own. Communities and towns. Gold mining sites. There were the gold mines. Witness buildings, and how to later we'll explain what a witness building is. Mission sites and schools, cemeteries and burial grounds, toll roads. Most of the Cherokee roads were toll roads in Cherokee Valley. Individual townhouses, the district courthouses. Maybe you're interested in researching enslaved among the Cherokee. Maybe you're interested in, in Hispanics. If I had an opportunity once to talk to the school and the classroom, and maybe a third or half of the students were Hispanic, so I just asked the person the question. I go, well, who's the first Hispanic who lived here? And, and half the, the kids who hadn't been paying attention because they were there, all of a sudden they perked up and I said, well, there's never so and so and so and so and he lived here in 1830. They had no idea that they're as much a part of this story as you and I. Who were, what stores were uh, existing? Who were the merchants? Who were the traders? Any of these things you can research, you can identify. You can use that. Most people who don't know much about this are going to connect with the story about an individual. You know, if you want to just talk about dates and places, their eyes will start blazing over. But if you tell the story, of a specific person or a specific community, particularly if they're connected to it, they will immediately be interested. You know what this is? This is the back 40 that gets plowed over and over and over again. And that's not what you want to do. You don't want to keep doing the same thing. What you do want to do is build on research that's already been done, which means you've got to identify what's already been done. So you need to review the chapter archives for all existing write-ups, reports, submittals, everything. You want to know what it is. You want to build up a, a searchable database. If you're interested in uh, researching Sally Hughes' theory, Okay. If you want to do that, what reports involve fairies that have already been done? Is there a preliminary report on her? What's already been done, and how can you build on it, and how can you learn from it? You can review, augment, and expand reports that were already done. Okay, As much as none of us want to admit we make mistakes, we all make mistakes. We all make errors. So if you don't let an error perpetuate, you can do uh, an updated report 
and correct errors that were that people just assumed. Footnote your work. Where did you find the information? How can somebody else? Don't say, you know, just because my friend said so. I'm not a footnote. Mm -hmm. Identify a site that nobody else has addressed. You know, um, re review reports for similar type sites so you can learn what resources are available for those guys. Ask questions, ask guidance, ask for help. You don't have to do it by yourself. You can get two or three people to work together on top of it. Look for new sources that weren't available 10, 15, 20 years ago. Build a shareable bibliography. What did you find? Where did you find it? If you're looking for something, somebody else is going to be looking for something like it later. Share a copy of your research reports with the Travis office. You don't have to submit it, but you got they can have a copy. You, you know, connect to them and you just say, you know, I want to research such and such and so and so. You know, anybody who's done anything like this before, if they've got it, they can help, they can share it with you. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. This this is not a spectator involvement. This is this is everybody can jump in and do something, and everybody's capable of doing something. Here are just and I pull up stuff. These are things that are in, in almost every library. The chapter may still have some of these things for sale. Um, records among the, of the Moravians. I think it's 10 or 11 volumes now this series has. Most of it focuses on Georgia. They're excellent. Don Chatham's book, Cherokee Plants, is still awesome. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Walker's books are all great. Um, Cherokee documents in the northeastern United States is a little harder to find, but it's the ABC, American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. They have mission sites all over Georgia. And all the records have almost all the records have been microfilmed, and there are two or three copies of microfilm in the state. So look for old maps. This is a map done in 1931 by John Capone, who was Surveyor General of Georgia. And it's not very well known. It's not utilized very much. But you can zoom in and you say, okay, here is Northeast. If you look up here, you can see Gold Diggers Road, Underwood's Gold Mine. Uh, you can see Rich Gold Mine. You can see uh, Ligon's Mill, Woolley's Mill. Sites that you may have heard of, but nobody's done anything with them. Nobody researched it. And gold mining was probably one of the big catalysts to the removal. And nobody's really researched it. You look on this map and you do like across the high tower at Wall River, you can see um, six is Old Town, one of the most important here. Right above it, Downing's Ferry. Move west, and you can see way over at Rome, John Ross and John Ridge. Even further west, you can see that along the Cusa, you can see right there, like in section four, like the 50 missionary. That's the highest mission, which still has a cemetery. And it's right off the road. And it's never been, I don't know that there's a report on it. I don't know that it, it certainly had not been certified. Uh, the road that you see right there that's going north south is the road to the Brian Mission, to, to Shuga Valley Road. And it was a major road. There's a little uh, community right at 1415, which I think it may be Island Town. I'm not sure. I'm not going to search it that close. But there are lots of towns. That, that need to be identified. Identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So this is the Georgia Surveyor General's plaques, which they surveyed all of North Georgia and made plaques. This is that road that you see there. Um, this is in Section 4, District 6. This is the landlock 139. This is the house 
of John Brown. And you go, well, there are lots of John Browns in the Cherokee Convention. This is the John Brown who also owned the quote tavern building and ferry at Chattanooga. He had a huge house in Georgia and had mills and lots of stuff there. I don't know if that house still stands or not. This is, I took the district plants. This is Lookout Valley in Northwest Georgia. Not all of it, but if you can see the, the red is the roads, blue is the uh, Lookout Creek. Um, that's the state line with Alabama. The yellow are fields that show up on the flats, and the green are houses or buildings. So you know exactly where the chairs live in this section of Lookout Valley. So there's a story to be able to tell. And the valuations will tell you who they were. That's all I want. Identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness. Most all of the county records that are extinct are online. You can sit home and do it. This is Cherokee County, Georgia, Superior Court, the state of Georgia versus log in the water, Artisha to Scott, for assault with intent to commit murder. I don't know if a courthouse is a certifiable site or not, but this is one case among a couple of hundred during the Cherokee County court minutes. All of those represent a story. Promote awareness. Preserved, protect, identify. This is Murray County County Commissioner's Minutes. So, this is one of the first things in, in that particular book. And they're dividing up the county into districts. Every one of these districts are full of road information and people. So, if you're interested in, in early Murray County, which had a huge coverage, you can identify all the roads which went from where, where which may not show up on there. It may not show up on the surveyor's roads. Identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness. This is a uh, record from National Archives, and it is a receipt from Joe Rogers, and it is for the heritage of 83 men and horses crossing the Coosa River. Captain Likens, Likens, L I K E N, Likens Company. They were an Alabama militia company who were ordered to go from Jacksonville, Alabama, where they were mustered in, to New Echota. So they had to cross a river. So, who Joe Rogers? Where was his family? Well, he was fairly well known. He's in the deed books as buying and selling land. There's a huge uh, state of Georgia Supreme Court case involving the ferry and who he sold it to. So it is one of the ferries at Rome. So you go here, I'm not saying what can get certified or not, but there's proof this his ferry was used to transport troops. Does that make that a certifiable site? I don't know. It's worth asking. So the Trail Cheers Association National. So you may know that we have the 1838 claims, which are online and searchable. A lot have been transcribed. Uh, on the far right is an 1842 claim. That's the next database that's going up. It's being worked on now. This particular claim is for Aliki, who was from Delonica. This claim has never been. It's never been published. It's never been put in a book. It's never been seen online. And it's just one I pulled out now. Out of the images. So this will be online. Um, on the far left bottom, this is a database. It's not available yet. The University of Georgia is putting up of all the Cherokee valuations of property and maps and transcriptions. So it, it's being worked on. No timing yet. We're going to not operate correctly. But, and it will have transcriptions and it will have the images. Um, on the total side, we're going to put also links to digital microfilm. So all the all the 
all that's available. You can sit home. You don't have to get in your car and go somewhere. You don't have to go working. But anything we can find that's going to be ditched out, we're going to put links to it. So that you can sit home and you can do a search. Identify, protect, preserve, promote awareness. So that's my portion. Anybody got questions? If you're online, you okay, type your questions in. And then they'll uh we'll, 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 we'll read them all. Okay, yes. Um kind of new to this research. Yeah. Um, so if all of us are out there doing research, mm -hmm. how does it kind of get coordinated and told into a storyline that already might exist? Or, yeah. Let, let me know that you're doing that. If you have something that came to your mind from your area and you <laughs> say, gee, that would be great if I could look it up and find out more about it. Let me know that that's what you're doing so I can waylay anybody else who might want to do that same project. Or let's say talk. Let's yeah. two people can come, work together. Come together as a come team. together as a team. And you can you can email me. Leslie will tell you that you made. She's not shy. No. <laughs> so and you say, okay, I need some help. What do I need? Where if I don't what have it on my computer, he does. <laughs> Actually, he has it on his phone. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Sure. We are, are I'm going to try to uh, coordinate. Our next meeting will be at the Bandy Center. Um, it's in Dalton, but they are currently holding all of our previous records that, that we've generated on the sites that we've worked on. And um, I'm hopefully going to have um, the next meeting there. Um, and also, I'm hoping next year, I wanted to reopen the door this year that asked all of our membership across our um, group, which is like 130 something now, right, Leslie? Mm -hmm. um, to um, take take control of their county um, and coordinate there. Um, and because they know more about what's still there and how things are located. But um I'm slow, I'm doing it very slowly, but I'm hoping to ask that, but I'm hoping to have it at our next meeting at the Bandy Center so everybody will be aware of how to use the records that we already have. Mm -hmm. so and I said, if you've got questions, share ask. Yeah. Online questions. Yeah, I put down Cherokee. Cherokee Historical Center is the next meeting important to this. Um, yes. But I um, uh, want to change it because this uh, this particular presentation uh, leads into better use of um, and, and, and work on the trails. So I would like to have the next meeting at the chair uh, at the Bandy Center in Dalton um, to get, follow on to get your our email newsletter. So and we can update there the website. Be a sign going around. Yeah. Um, right. We have two questions online. Margaret asks, number one, can we have the list of 24 counties with Cherokees printed on the Georgia Toto website? And yes. number two, which map shows the gold mines? Okay, that, uh, yes, uh, I will email the image to uh, Sharon so we can get put on the website. Or at least it can be transcribed on the website of any counties. Hi, Margaret. Okay, the map is the 1831 John Bethune map, E T H U N E. And I got the copy that I have off of the Library of Congress website, maps website. So you can go home and, and download the image yourself if you want to. Yeah, or I will email it to Cheryl. Yes. Can we be posting this on YouTube? And new slideshows so everybody that's asking those questions could often I've had to work from home and haven't got to go to meetings mm -hmm. and that's great access so make sure that people ask I'll, those I'll questions you can be posted it's marvelous mm -hmm. so thank you and do you I know that the assessors um have been well documented and their assessments 
Is there any place that you know of that has a list of agents who actually sold the property? You sent me one on Elon McConnell. Yeah. When we were doing uh, places in Carroll, but, but we're interested in kind of bigger. Bigger picture, yeah. yeah. That is on the University of Georgia database that I pointed to. It has two components to it. One is called evaluations, evaluations of improvements. That's the, the physical aspect, buildings, farms, fields, that kind of stuff. The other part is called returns of property. That's what those, which is the personal property yeah. that they would have owned. And that will be on their website as well. They have all of that digitized. Great. So, I, I, but no time now, I talked to Claudio this week and there's, the IT people are still working. Thanks. And it's not all the valuations yet. We're still looking for all the valuations. Well, Walker did enough, you know. He did, it, yeah. Did. I mean, so the stuff like Don Chapman, Walker's book, mm -hmm. uh, all, all of that is known, but there's still books that were not microfilmed that we're trying to identify exactly what this is. Yes. I was in Washington a couple weeks ago and we found another word. Yeah, he does do a lot in books. The old Milton County, Little River yep. area, and this, you know, they had the Little River uh, town there with yep. 300 chicken, you know, so we're we're just scrounging. <laughs> well, that's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to try. Yeah. <laughs> Are you familiar with the Green Russell properties? No, uh, but you can. You, we can talk. To them. I probably got stuff on it. Okay. I just don't know. It's just around the road. Okay. So next is going to be Angelica Sanchez Clark. She is with the National Trails Office, and she's the historian, and she is going to talk specifically about certification. Now, not every site is certifiable. She's going to talk what is. But if you don't, if a site is not certifiable, it doesn't mean from the chapter standpoint, you can't identify it. You can't promote awareness about it because they're all important sites. A lot of criteria that become certifiable and there's even scripture criteria that makes it a high impact site. So you research everything because you are supposed to identify, promote, protect awareness. So I wanted to thank you, Mike, for inviting those of us from the NPS National Trails Office to be with, with you today. And um, as you mentioned, Mike, I'm going to talk about certification, but I'm going to give you all just a little bit of an overview of what our office does. Um, and so let me advance my slide. And I think there's always a little bit of a delay. Oh, I see a screen up on your screen. All right. Okay, I'm going to try to advance. Come on. Okay, so this is where I had left off. All right. So um, as I as I have said, um, the Trail of Tears is a national historic trail. It's part of the National Trails system. And in that system, currently we have 11 National Scenic Trails. And Mike, you might need to mute yourself or not. Okay. Uh, and we have 21 National Historic Trails and over 1,200 national recreation trails across the United States. So National Historic Trails are designated by Congress and they commemorate long distance historic routes. And this is a really important distinction because people often don't quite understand what a National Historic Trail is. Uh, in and, and they always try to compare them to scenic trails and recreation trails. And so emphasizing the word historic is really, really important. And while um, we do provide recreational uh, experiences along the National Historic Trails, we focus a lot on um, researching uh, and providing educational experiences for the public. And so a lot of this type of education and research is based on 
uh, identifying historic sites and original trail segments that were created, used, or experienced by the original trail travelers. And this is a lot of what Mike was talking about. How do we identify? How do we research? How do we protect? And how do we promote um, the history of these trails? And a lot of times it's through these very, very much um physical remnants, trail traces. It's how we can make the history of the Trail of Tears come alive for the public. So usually these historic trails are not established as one contiguous trail. And again, that's another, um, another feature of historic trails that does cause some confusion for the public because they want to know how they can hike the trail. They want to know where they can bike along the trail. And with our partners, we've been able to identify segments of these historic trails where the public can do just that. But again, it is something that we're constantly educating um, the public about. So the National Park Service administers national historic trails, but we don't own or manage the land. And as I'll explain in the next slide, we work with the public and with private partners to help us to assist in developing and protecting a lot of these historic sites and trail segments. So the National Trails Office administers 10 National Historic Trails and the Route 66 Quarter Preservation Program. So there you see a map of all 10 National Historic Trails, including um, or plus Route 66. And then you'll see an inset there of the Trail of Tears. And if you have any questions about any of the other trails, you can you can feel free to ask me. So what exactly does the National Trails Office do? So first, I want to say that we, um, we are headquartered in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but we also have offices in Salt Lake City and in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Albuquerque is about an hour south of Santa Fe. And so, um, Coincidentally, today, our, those of us presenting represent each of these offices. So I am based out of Albuquerque, and M. Kessler uh, is out of Santa Fe, and Chad is out of our Salt Lake City office, and you'll meet them shortly. So our staff is made up of interdisciplinary specialists that include archaeologists, landscape architects, planners, historians, GIS specialists, interpretive specialists, and a partnership and outreach coordinator. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the work that the resource information management, interpretation, and outreach and engagement teams do, the type of work that we do. And I should say that um, I currently lead the history team within the National Trails Office. Uh, we have two historians plus myself, but I also have a new role within the office as the outreach, uh, as the partnerships and outreach coordinator. And, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that specific role, but it pretty much encompasses um, certification, histor historical research, and working with all of the other folks in my office, um, as well as with our partners. So as I mentioned, uh, the National Park Service, uh, our role when it comes to National Historic Trails is as trail administrators. We don't own or manage any of the lands that the Trail of Tears traverses. So we work closely with partners across the country um, to research, identify, protect, promote the trail. And these partners can include tribal, federal, state and local governments, private landowners, nonprofit associations, and universities, just to name a few. So on the Trail of Tears, our primary non-federal partner is the National Trail of Tears Association and its state chapters. Um, other partners include the Cherokee Nation, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, MTSU Center for Historic Preservation, 
University of North Alabama, Western Carolina University, other federal agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, and more. As we like to say, we will work with anyone who wants to work with us. So turning to partnership site certification specifically. So certification is a process that's specific to the National Trail System Act. It's a partnership that helps landowners protect and preserve their historic trail properties and share them with others. So we don't enter into partnership site certification agreements with federal um, agencies that, that either have trail trace or actually manage land that the trails cross. And the reason that is, is because federal agencies should already be working to um, protect the national historic trails that go through their lands. So this is really for um, state, county, city, um, sites, you know, that they man that they own or manage, as well as private landowners. And I want to really stress that this is a volunteer voluntary partnership. So voluntarily, we agree to work jointly on planning, interpretation, resource management, and other matters that relate to the historic trail site or segment. And together, we strive to meet the goals and objectives of the comprehensive management and youth plan for the trail. Um, I'm, I'm on this screen, I'm just showing a couple of kind of cover, cover sheets or examples of the of what you can find online. And that is a link there. And I'd be happy to share that out with all of you in the chat. But if you go to that link, you can actually pull up a um, a guide to certification. You can read through it. Um, you can see examples of what this one page agreement looks like. Um, and then, um, and you'll see contact information there to reach out to me. So the basic requirements, of course, are that the, um, the owner of, owner or manager of the site that is seeking certification, you know, that they're willing to enter into this agreement with us. Um, another really important part of certification is that there needs to be public access. And um, when it comes especially to private property, that is something that we're really flexible about. But I, I do want to make that clear that if you would like to, to have that designation um, as a a site certified um, site, then there needs to be some public access. Uh, but what we've done in the past is we've been able to do that. You know, maybe you want to offer a guided tour uh, three times a year. That would be public access. Um, maybe you want to work with your local um, historical association to provide those kind of tours because you yourself may not feel comfortable you know, giving a guided tour, that is considered public access. So it's something that um, that we can talk about if, if you're interested in certification. Um, once you're certified, because we do emphasize this public access, uh, you know, we hope that the partner will be willing to have the site promoted on our websites, on our National Park Service app. Um, because the goal of certification is to provide the public um, with places that they can visit to learn more about the history of the trail. So what are the benefits of um, certification? Um, in my opinion, there are lots and lots of benefits. And I don't see any negatives to certification, but I'm sure they're out there. But because this is voluntary, we would never uh, ask you to do anything with your property that you are not willing to do. So I think that's really important um, to keep in mind. Um, and actually, I, I wanted to go, let me go back up to that previous slide real quick. Um, 
I, I don't want to get bogged down with too many, or I don't want to bog you down with too many details because we can always follow up with one-on-one um, conversations, but there are two types of certification that, that we enter into these types of agreements. One of them are with historic sites. And Mike mentioned, for example, um, witness structures. So if you have a, a property or a trail trace that you that you would like to get certified, then that would be under our historic sites uh, certification. And so those sites have to have a direct historical association to the trail, and they need to be located on the designated alignment. So this is important if you're seeking certification as a historic site. Now, if you're seeking certification as an interpretive facility, this would include a museum or a visitor center. It should be located near the designated alignment, and it should already feature some interpretation or connection to the trail. So we want to know if you already have visitors that are going um, uh, to learn more about the trail or to ask questions about the trail. So those are the two um, the two types of certification that we do. And if you're interested in, in partnership site certification, like I said, you can go to this link or you can reach out to me directly and we can we can talk directly. We can um, I can tell you a little bit more. You can share a little bit more about the site that you're looking to certify. And then I would send you this um, property contact information sheet that you would fill out and return to me. And then that would kick off the review process on my end. It's a relatively easy process. Honestly, in a lot of cases, I'm the holdup just because of time and capacity. Um, but it is a relatively easy um, process. I've, I'm have i even willing to sit on the phone with you and help you fill out this form if you have any questions about that. All right. So back to the benefits of, of partnership certification. So um, in our office, when a site is certified, it helps us prioritize the type of technical assistance that we can provide. Depending on the type of site that you all have, uh, we could work with you to put up a, a site ID sign, um, help you with interpretation. If you are a site that gets a lot of visitors, we will provide you with the Trail of Tears um, National Park Service um, brochures, the passport stamp program, um, depending also on who owns the certified site, uh, we would be able to prioritize uh, your funding needs. We would be able to help you uh, seek funding, whether it's for preservation or interpretation, uh, historical research, that kind of stuff. So it's really important. Um, it's a really great way of formalizing that relationship with the National Park Service. And it, like I said, it helps us prioritize where our technical assistance goes. So, oops, before I go to M. So um, there are currently 79 certified sites all along the Trail of Tears. In Georgia, we have 11, 11 certified sites, and I can name those. We are also working on several potential ones. And thanks to Mike, he's reached out with a few that we're going to be working on looking at for Georgia. Um, so the 11 sites are already featured on um, our National Park Service Trail of Tears website, and Em's going to talk a little bit more about that. But I'll just go over the list because um, Mike mentioned that there might be some questions about what has been certified, what has not. Uh, you can find that information on our website, and I can also share it with you. But the 11 that we have certified right now are the Van House Historic Site, Van Cherokee Cabin, Running Waters, uh, also known as the John Ridge Home, Rockdale Plantation, also known as the George, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Ader Home, 
We have the road from Ross to Ridges, the new Dakota State Historic Site, the John Ross House, Funk Heritage Center, Chieftains Museums, also known as the Major Ridge Home, the Cherokee Garden at Green Meadows, and Cedar Town Cherokee Removal Camp. So those are the 11 that we have. And like I said, Mike and I are working on a few other potentials. Um, so Em is going to talk about how, um, what happens, right, after a site gets certified, where do we go from there? And one of those is, one of those next steps is to work with our interpretation team uh, and specifically with our digital media specialist, M. Kessler, um, to get information about your site out to the public. So I don't know if anybody has any questions right now or if you want to wait until the end. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. So Mike, yeah, let me know if you would like M to just uh, go ahead and pick up and then we can save questions until the end. And you're muted. There, we have one question here in the room. Okay. Hi, yes. Um, I heard you mention that um, the um, to be certified, it needs to be in the designated alignment. I'm just curious if they don't know exactly yet where all the sites are, such as some of the encampments and whatnot. How does that fit the chicken and the egg of a designated alignment? So yeah, that's a great question. So, and and I and the reason that I emphasize the designated alignment is because uh, these national historic trails, as I mentioned, are designated by Congress, right? And so when they're designated, that means that these proposed trails have undergone a feasibility study. They've been deemed. Um, you know, as having met the criteria for a National Historic Trail, and then Congress designates it. And along with that, there is an approximate route. So then when Congress designates a National Historic Trail, it kicks off a what we call a, a planning stage uh, of developing a comprehensive management plan. And, and it's during that process that a lot of research, a lot of ground truthing, um, a lot of GIS work is done to refine that, um, I don't know if you want to call it like a trail corridor that was identified during the feasibility study. So by the time we get to a final comprehensive management plan, that's the designated trail alignment. And as trail administrators, uh, that's what we work with. Now, as Mike knows, we do have a route refinement process because, you know, Trail of Tears was designated many, many years ago. And there's a lot of, of ongoing research that's done. And so um, if there are partners out there, and we've worked with a few um, in the, uh, on the Trail of Tears who feel that the designated alignment is, is incorrect because of new research, then we will work with them on what we call a route refinement. But you have to keep in mind that we are not authorized to, to add routes or to add substantial mileage to the designated alignment. That's a congressional act. So if you have a property that you think um, uh, is on the designated alignment or you're wondering, all you have to do is send it to us, send us the address, and we can tell you immediately. And Chad, who is going to present in a little bit, he's one of our GIS specialists. Um, if if any of you, you know, and and, and I'm, I'm going to say this because I am not I'm not tech savvy. I the GIS stuff goes over my head. 
but we've got the the days designated um trail data for trail of tears available to the public and so people can actually like download it and then look for their look for their addresses and see where you fall on that alignment so i i probably explained way more than you needed but i just kind of wanted to to kind of provide some context as to why i i do talk about the designated alignment Mike, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I'm just going back to my presentation. Research, research, <laughs> research, 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 research. Yeah. Research. I understand yeah. it's yeah. ongoing. It's an ongoing thing. So yeah. if you challenge something that Congress but, but has if, designated, then you have got yeah. to, be to prove your case. Because but, you but if you prove your case and then get Congress to be able to legally change something. Well, so I'm just telling you. Correctly imagining. <laughs> no, I mean, I have a book in 2005 no. and there is a lot of recommended research. Yeah. And I'm just imagining how would that work? So. So th you. there's been a lot done since 2000. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, yeah right. Well, you know, I would say, how do you prove that a road existed? How do you prove that a road didn't get changed in 1884? You know, it's an old road. Yeah, but it is, was the road there in 1836? That's the bigger question. Yeah. And, um, and, and, if, and if you're just wondering about a site that you know about or that you own and you're just curious, like I said, you can just send us the... Um, the address, the uh, the GPS coordinates, and we'd be able to tell you right away if it yeah. is or it's not. And if it's not on the designated alignment, then you can decide if if uh, if it's something that's worthwhile to do some additional research into, and and then we can go from there. So it, part of our our calling is to educate. So a, a specific site may not be certifiable. It may not fit any of the criteria to be certified, okay. but it's still important. And you can still write so the removal. It, this is not you know the dead end. Right. It is out of a hundred, maybe only one site is actually gonna fit the yeah. the, the criteria that Angelica and her team have to work under, but it doesn't mean it's not important. You can still do all the work and make people aware of this right. on a local basis. Thanks. You yeah, because there's other there's other there's like there's other things. Things. Yeah, Georgia State, and uh, so it's okay. Yeah. Don't get worked and out so, just getting one little gold star. So that's that's okay. We're not the federal government, so I always push against the yeah. chicken yeah. and egg situation. Yeah. 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 Uh, As a for Angelica, yeah. Um, you mean I think you said that there's like two types of certification. What was right. the other one? And uh, other than being on uh, the designated route, What's the so uh, in interpretive facilities like museums yeah. and facilities. and and visitor centers, uh, yeah. those uh, sometimes are not on the designated alignment. They're they're five miles off. But if they're if if you already uh, interpret the history of the Trail of Tears, you have visitors that go to your site to learn about the Trail of Tears, then, um, then we can look into certifying it and helping you promote the, and interpret the history of the trail. So that's the other, yeah. the other type. So, so I, I'm aware of, of in Alabama, the, I think recently the George Lowry house was, am I correct? George Lowry. Uh, there, there was probably a so. There five. So, but they're relatively close yeah. to a removal fork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have my my list up, so I can always do some uh, quick searches. You can put names in the in the chat if you're if you want to know if they've been certified or. Okay, not. we do have you have an online question. Uh, Marker asks, what is the passport stamp program? So have you and and um I've I've never been a park ranger, M has. <laughs> so she might be able to explain a little bit better about it. Um sure. M, do you want to jump in? 
Yeah, so the National Park Service has a passport stamp program. It's essentially modeled after a passport. You get a passport. You don't have to have one. You can use a piece of paper. And each park unit or trail has a stamp with a date on it. So people actually go around. I mean, I love it. It's worldwide. People are very into it. Um, And we have a trail of tears stamp. So if your site wants to have a stamp, there's a process for doing that, contacting our office, um, and we'll get you in touch with Karen. So so somebody here is showing off their passport. Oh, great. Oh, nice. Passport fan. Yes. As a park ranger, we always loved when the passport folks came to the front desk. It is a uh, a really yeah. fun program, and it's a great way. When I'll talk a little bit more about that, using some of the National Park Service brand identity to um, widen your audience, you know, to reach uh, some new folks that are out there. So yeah, it's a really mm-hmm. cool program. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's let anybody have any other questions they'd like to. Okay. So let's let's move on. Thank you, Angelica. It was awesome. Okay. So I no I I I'm glad we were able to to get through it. (laughs) All right, Em, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, here we go. So Rachel, does she need? Okay. Cool. All right. Okay, well, thank you all for having uh, me here today. I'm really excited to talk about some of those different outreach and interpretive opportunities that Angelica hinted at that your site can participate in or may already be participating in. As Angelica mentioned, my name is M, or Emily Kessler, and I work for the National Historic Trails Office as a digital media uh, specialist. So I'm the one that manages the website for the Trail of Tears and our NPS mobile app that I'll talk a little bit more about and our social media accounts. So if you ever have any questions about those, Um, please feel free to reach out. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can participate more in these digital media outreach opportunities. Um, So, you know, your sites are amazing and you all know your sites and do great interpretation, but there's some really great benefits to being a National Historic Trail with the National Park Service. And that's, as I mentioned, we can use some of that National Park Service brand identity. You know, people love the National Park Service to do um, to reach a wider audience uh, through some different outreach opportunities. So number one, you may or may not be aware that the National Park Service now has a Park Service wide mobile app. So instead of having different mobile applications for every trail, there is just one. Um, and I'll go into how to find that if you haven't already. And so it's really great. Millions of people have been downloading it and our trails are featured. And so some of the benefits that go along with that for the Trail of Tears is that when people download the mobile app to, um, you know, explore Yellowstone, for example, or to go to um, Smoky Mountains or any of the parks in the Southeast, they will have the opportunity to find those sites, those Trail of Tears sites as well. And that's what's happening, actually. We're finding from partners um, whose sites are already listed that folks are finding them using the the mobile app just because they downloaded it to visit a, a, a big national park. Um, you know, it enhances the on the ground visitor experience. There's a lot of different features that we can use to help your site. Um, a good example of this is sometimes, you know, there might be a walking tour at your site. Um, you know, people might come in and get a little pamphlet, for example, and you're kind of wondering, what can I do to make that that digital? Um, this is one of those those opportunities. Um, return on investment, obviously, it's free. So you don't have to pay anything. We don't have to pay to be involved. There's no subscription. Um, it is simply part of being a part of the Park Service. Um, and then a huge thing for me personally and for the Park Service, of course, is accessibility. So if the accessibility features are built in. So folks that have sight impairment or hearing impairment um, will be able to use the mobile app. Um, And that's great because um, we want to be inclusive and we want people to be able to either explore in person or even just use their phone to explore maybe when you can't sleep at night. Um, So that's a really great feature. There's also the NPS.gov integration. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, about how if you're featured in one place, you get featured everywhere, which makes it really easy for partners. So if you have not already downloaded the mobile app, you will just simply go to your mobile app store and search National Park Service. 
a bunch of different apps will come up, but what you're really looking for is that, that black box with the arrowhead and it says the official app of 420 plus parks. That's the one you want to download. Um, and if for some reason you can't find it, let me know, or you can contact me after this and I can send you a, a kind of like a link that might help you, but you do have to go to your own mobile app store, whether it's uh, Google play or, um, or, um, the Apple store. Okay. And then once you download it, then you're going to open the mobile app and you're going to swipe left and explore the NPS. And the next thing you're going to see is a kind of a search bar, just like any other thing. And you can search in trail of tears and that is how you will find the trail of tears. And also many, many other things, um, any other parks and other, um, trails. So it's really, really cool that they've done this. You know, we've really worked on expanding the content the last few years, but the Trail of Tears is really where we need your help to um, add more to what's available currently. So once you do open the Trail of Tears mobile app, this is kind of the homepage you'll get. Um, there's things to do. There's tours. There's amenities. Um, we will be adding, as I mentioned, trail sites to visit by state. We'll talk about that in a minute. Park calendar, park news. You can just imagine that says trail. Um, the passport stamp location. So if you get a passport stamp for your site, people like that wonderful person who has the passport stamp can just simply search and find all the pa passport stamps near them. Um, there's also volunteer opportunities and basic information. So really, it's a great platform to do a lot of things. And once you start to explore it, you'll realize it's it's kind of bare bones right now. We're really, like, as I mentioned, trying to focus on Trail of Tears and um, kind of beef up the content and we really need your help. So currently what you'll do when you uh, open up that Trail of Tears homepage is you have to go to the bottom bar, it's a green bar, it says home and there's a map. It's very similar to other apps you may have used. Um, you press the map and this is the map. And these are actually the current sites we have already for Trail of Tears. And your site may be included. You might be confused about this. Um, the reason may be is that we're, um, if you're a certified site, for example, already, we needed to create a page for you. Um, if you are already a places to go, we may have created a page for you. If you have wayside exhibits, um, we may have created a page for you. And there's reasons we had to do this, but again, um, this is going to be the common theme here. We need your help. So if you find that you have a page, um, it should also be very bare bones and we need your help to beef up the content. So currently we have a map and in the future, this is an example from Santa Fe National Historic Trail. Once we do have a lot of trail of tier sites listed by state, it would say trail sites to visit in Georgia, and then your sites would be listed here. So it's just another way people can use the app. Um, so as I mentioned, to find the mobile app, you're going to be on the Trail of Tears mobile app homepage down on the bottom green bar, you'll see map, press map, and then you'll see a map. And just like on Google Maps or Apple Maps, you can log, you know, zoom in and you'll get a closer look at, um, at the, uh, the Georgia map there. And you can see there's already some sites listed. So if you press on those green bubbles, you can get a a listing of what those sites might be or zoom in. For example, here is the Cherokee Gardens um, at Green Meadows. And so that that site has a page because of the wayside exhibits. Um, and so we're going to use you as an example. Um, and so, yeah, you can see on that page, if you were to click on that, this is the page for Cherokee Gardens at Green Meadows. Very basic information, basically um, tells a little bit about the site. It's really kind of like a landing page. Don't think of this as a mobile tour. I know I've mentioned, Carol Clark mentioned, there's a great Georgia tour in the works or has been done. Um, it's not necessarily used like that. It's kind of a way for folks to find new sites, just like you would if you open your Google Maps and you're searching for a restaurant, right? Best Thai food near me. Um, and so similar to that, this will let people find Cherokee Gardens through the map and eventually the list, right? And then they'll actually can link to more site information, which takes them to um, a link for Cherokee Gardens at Green Meadows or your site website, right? We're not the experts, you are. This is just a landing page to get people going there. Gives a little bit about the significance and then um, the audio exhibits, uh, The excuse me, the audio description for the wayside exhibits that, uh, that are there. So how can you be included in this? Um, you know, I mentioned, 
this idea of having a page that may have already been created for your site. And so you'll hear us talk a lot about a places page. That's the key to this whole presentation. You know, if you want to be included in the mobile app, if you want to be included on our on our website, and if you have a certified site or you're going to be certified, you know, we need to create a places page for your site. And essentially, as I mentioned, it's just a landing page similar to like a Google landing page. It's nps.gov slash places slash your site not your site name. So it helps because, you know, your site now is searchable across nps.gov. You know, anybody who goes to park service sites is going to get linked. Um, there's going to be metadata that's going to share information about your site. So again, it's just a whole new or wider audience you may be reaching. This is that same information from the mobile app. So you create one page, you're featured on our website, you're featured on the mobile app. Um, and again, you control the information. So though we do have a format, um, you know, we really want to work with partners to, to put here what you want. Um, and you may find that people are visiting and having questions. You know, can we answer those questions here? How can we work with you to use this page to basically just help promote your site? Um, and so, again, you want to place this page if you want to be included. Places pages are used in a variety of ways. I've kind of alluded to this, and I can send you this graphic, too. Um, essentially, the places page is used, you know, for in physical, right? We could put a QR code on your exhibits, and that way people could actually see those wayside interpretive exhibits um, online, or they could get audio description, which basically describes the exhibit. We use that on social media, we use it on the mobile app, um, and of course on nps.gov. So again, the key is this one web page, the places web page for your site. Um, what do they do? We describe the significance of the site to the trail. If there's quick info for visitings, we wanna to link to partner sites, your site, website. Um, one of our interpretive rangers has been creating videos. Um, so it's a, you know, really great to have like an intro video, a wayside audio description, more information, images, guided tours. I mean, really, it's really whatever you kind of need it to be, um, to help reach people and get them to come visit your site in person, or just really want to know more, um, about how your site is significant. And I will say right now, because I was just thinking about this during Angelica's, uh, question Q and A is that unlike certified sites, um, you know, for places pages, we really just want to feature or have places pages for sites that are um, significant to the trail. So it's not as um, as crucial that it's on a designated alignment per se, um, but really that it's significant to the trail or that it does significant interpretation about um, about the trail. So we're a little bit broader in how we can feature um, sites on these on these uh, different outreach elements. <clears throat> so again, and I, you know, this is the way you have your places page right here for Cherokee Gardens. Um, you know, you can see it, it's going to be featured on the map in the mobile app. And it's also going to be featured on our Georgia page on our Trailiteers website. So um, it's featured in two different places, just from that, that one page, the NPS mobile app and the NPS Trail of Tears website. So it sounds like a lot, but it's really just a lot of stuff on our end. Um, for the partner, really all you have to do is contact me. This should be Emily underscore Kessler. I don't I cannot get that thing to go away. Um, but I'm sure anybody can give you my contact information. I'll put it in the chat. Essentially, there's just a form, super easy. You fill out the form, it's fillable, or you can just write me an email with the answers. You can fill out a Word document. I'm super flexible, whatever works for you. Sometimes we even have phone conversations or interviews where you just answer the questions and I can type it out. Um, but we draft the page together. So we'll work back and forth to have the places page feature the content that you want it to. Um, and then it goes live and you know, you're know you're all over the place. So um, it's a really great tool, as I mentioned, to further your outreach. Um, you know, even if you're not a site that wants to be promoted, we may create a places page for you, but we just would say it's not open to the public. Um, it's a private site. Um, and that's because, again, that's how we list our sites, um, you know, for the certified sites. That's how we feature sites for all across our, our digital media. So, um, the key is the places page. And I hope that I'll get to work with all of you um, on, on creating them. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if anybody has any questions. Okay.
And M, I shared all of our, our emails. Um, oh, fabulous. Chat. Thank you so much. I was like, there's something going on in the chat, but I didn't want to distract my <laughs> That was brain. me. I apologize. I have a one-year-old, so I slept like two hours last night. So I'm like, whoa, okay. I hope that all made sense. If not, you can email me. I'd be happy to have a conversation, but I can take questions. Any questions in the room? Um, I sure. sent um, Emily a uh, message about this because um, I definitely want us to start taking photographs of our site and getting the information she needs on her form. So, um, Emily, I, I was when you sent you a, a message yesterday, actually. You know, it's, I was wondering, I was about to email you back, and then I was like, hmm, I bet she'll be in the presentation, so maybe I will feed two birds with one feeder, but um, I will send you the form. So thank you. Emily, Emily Sharon was jumping up and down in her seat while you were talking. Yay, I'm so glad. I love efficiency. So this is fabulous. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure we will have there will be 100,000 questions to come once people start realizing what all they can do with and it. And no, you know what? Everybody during my presentation starts <laughs> to go on their phone and kind of download the app and play around. So it's okay if you did that yeah. too. I totally understand. So usually I'll get emails later. Um, but again, find your site if it already is there and um, let me know what you want me to change. <laughs> enhance the information that's there. Exactly. You're, thank you. So, thank you all so much. All right. Well, Ch you. Chad is next. So I'm going to I'm going to ha hand it off to my colleague, Chad, who is going to talk to you about another great opportunity for you to um, participate digitally with our office. Hey, Chad. Okay, can you guys see? Um, this main screen here? Yes. yes. Awesome. Well, um, thank you guys for your patience. And um, so welcome to our National Trails Asset Inventory presentation. Uh, my name is Chad Ennis, and I'm a GIS specialist with the National Trails Office out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, so today we're just going to give you a brief presentation on uh, a way that you can contribute to our efforts um, to help map signs that relate to the Trail of Tears. Um, unlike what Em presented earlier, I would recommend going ahead and downloading this app right now. Um, as you'll see later, we'll have to walk you through a few things, but once you have the correct permissions to use this, um, it's pretty easy. So I'm a part of the Resource Information Management Team. Uh, we are a geographic information system specialist team made up of myself and then my supervisor, Brian Deaton, out of uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. So in the next 15 minutes, we'll briefly discuss uh, what the National Trails Office does uh, in the goals of our asset inventory project and then how you can join it. So the National Park Service does not manage the land that the NHTs are located on. Rather, we administer the trails themselves. To achieve our goal of identification and protection of historic, uh, the historic route for public use and enjoyment, it is essential that we continue to collaborate with our partner organizations like you all. One of the best ways to enhance our partnerships is uh, through sharing our spatial data and empowering partners to use GIS technology. And GIS is Geographic Information Systems. You're gonna be hearing that a lot, I'm sure. The NHT Wayside and Sign Inventory Project is a quick and easy way for partners to assist our office and in turn, their own organization. So here's a map real quick. Um, earlier, I uh, mentioned that there were some online ways that you could view the uh, official alignment of the trail, and we can get into that a little more later, but this is one example of the alignment in Georgia. And this is another, this is the, uh, this is the actual uh, historic trails map viewer. One of the main focuses of the NTIR office is to make trails data and historic and history freely accessible and available to the public. The National Historic Trails Viewer seen here is one of the easiest and quickest ways for partners and the public uh, to access trails data. 
access either through the NPS website or directly through the ESRI ArcGIS Online website. The Trails Viewer is a fully interactive map that displays our trails data, hosted by ESRI, that is the company that makes these apps. Using the map viewer allows you to view the designated alignments of the 10 historic trails and the Route 66 corridor preservation program. One second. Just having some technical difficulties here. Okay. <laughs> So following the camels through Arizona, <laughs> which we actually do have camels in Arizona. Okay, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. You're just gonna see my notes here, but I guess that's probably the easiest way for us to do it right now. Right now, all we see is the camels. Yeah, we see your oh. camels. Are those real camels or just shadows of camels? <laughs> So there we go. Okay, so the office assists uh, partners like the National Trail of Tears Association um, and other jurisdictions and land managers uh, to develop signing and interpretation across the Trail of Tears. NHT. Using Survey123, another ESRI product, we are able to empower partners who are already out on the trail to help document where these assets are. This benefits the NTIR, that's us, as we receive more frequent updates to the condition and location of trail waysides and signs. Additionally, it benefits partner organizations like the association by creating a direct way for partners to contribute and stay involved in the mapping of trails and trail-related resources. A great example of this collaboration benefiting both parties is when partners use the Survey123 app to report the condition of waysides and signage. By updating us on the condition of these resources, we can better prioritize the updates and, in some cases, replacement of the resources. So here you can see one example of something I'm sure you've all come across in the field. Uh, it's one of our waysides, and unfortunately, um, you've probably noticed that sometimes these either get vandalized, or they just get completely sun bleached, or sometimes people even hit them with their vehicles by accident. Um, it's hard for us to get out and see every one of these, especially uh, frequently enough to be, you know stay up to date on their condition. So with this app, you all are able to tell us, hey, this one really needs to be replaced. You can submit a picture of it along with the location, and um, our signing team can help prioritize that, the uh, replacement of that. So why is this important? The project provides an overview of the wayside and signing efforts our office has conducted through the decades. In some cases, neither our office nor our partners have record of certain projects along the trail. By utilizing the survey, we can start to fill out some of the blanks. This includes questions like, how many assets are there? What is their condition and do they need replacement? Where are they located? This knowledge will allow the interpretation team and the design and development team to prioritize future waysides and signing efforts. So it's easy to identify assets that the NTIR, NTIR office has supported because they will mostly include the logo of the trails or trail that they are associated with. These triangular logos are easily identifiable from a distance. They include interpretive waysides, directional signage, 
interpreted facilities, and other signs displaying the logo. And here's just a few examples here of the many that we have. Just give me one second. I'm trying to. There we go. So, waysides are one of the most common ways for the public to interact with historic trails and their resources. They help us visualize the past in places where evidence of the trails remains, but they may but may no longer be evident to the untrained eye. They help add important historic context to the significant sites along the way. As one of our most common assets, waysides can be made from several different materials and sizes and can be found in various conditions depending on the elements and the traffic they receive. Some of the most common issues that we come across when reviewing waysides for replacement are vandalism or intentional damage, fading and cracks caused by exposure to the elements, or other damage caused by um, animals or vehicles. Waysides are either upright or low profile. Each wayside panel is a separate recording in the Survey123 app. And that means in that lower right hand corner, when you see those two that are joined together, when you're recording those in the app, you would record those as two separate ones, even though they're technically on the same um, panel. The National Trails Office has three different types of signs we use to mark the NHTs. Road signs, pedestrian signs, and site ID signs. The newest family of road signs shown on this slide were de designed to follow the federal highway standards and meet all MUTCD requirements. Pedestrian signs mark the historic route or close approximation of the route of the NHTs and where they coincide with modern day trails. These signs can be found anywhere there is a good opportunity for the public to walk, hike, and or ride along the trails in both urban and rural locations. Road signs mark the historic route and historic crossing locations of the NHTs and where they coincide with modern public roads. Road signs also, also direct the public to specific NHT related sites. Some of the older road sign types you might see installed along the roadways include auto tour route signs. These signs were used in the past to mark an all weather route that was in a close approximate location to the NHT. We no longer use this sign type, but it will still be important to survey these signs if you come across them in the field. <laughs> and site ID signs are for those locations where the public can learn and experience the trail, such as the Rockdale Plantation. And then facility exhibits are museum or visitors with interpreted materials uh, displays the NHT logo or an exhibit that has been funded by our office. Here you can see an example of a facility exhibit displaying the Trail of Tears NHT logo with, within the Museum of the Cherokee Indian in Cherokee, North Carolina. You may also come across other signage that was not created by our office, but is related to the trail. These include any sign that does not neatly fit into the categories we mentioned above, such as the state historic marker. These may or may not include the official NHT logo, but either way, it's still okay for you to go ahead and collect those as long as you note them accordingly in the survey app. Additionally, you may come across a location where you know there used to be a sign or logo, but it is now severely damaged or completely missing. Reporting this helps us prioritize replacement efforts. So safety is essential for anyone collecting wayside and sign data, especially for our partners. Safety while collecting data must be prioritized, specifically in the case of any NPS road directional signage. 
The office advises using a two-person team to allow one person to drive and the other person to quickly collect uh, the data from the passenger seat. Do not record any location where safety is a concern during data collection. If there is not an adequate area to pull off the roadway, do not attempt to collect NPS road directional signage. Also, please remember that we are not collecting cultural resource data with this project. So Esri, the app that, um, or the company that hosts this app that we use, is not considered a secure enough location to secure, uh, to store cultural resource data or any personally identifiable information. And PII, personally identifiable information, includes any information about yourself or another partner, um, such as your address or your, you know, you definitely don't want to enter things like your social security number, um, maybe just your first name and, and nothing else. Um, the NPS also does not want to encourage anyone to disturb culturally significant sites or tread on private property. So just to be clear, only waysides and signs should be reported. So for anyone who wishes to take part in the asset inventory, please email myself and Brian. Our emails will be at the end of the presentation, and I'm also happy to put them in the chat or um, send them to uh, a group email so that you all have them for your record. We will guide you through this process and the sign-up process in more detail. And then once you have an account, uh, we will add you to the group on ArcGIS Online, which is seen here. Uh, on the group page, you can find more information, including training documents and just how-to uh, guides. So the app, if you choose to participate, that you will be using is Survey123, an Esri ArcGIS online product. Survey123 is a form-based and very user, is, sorry, is form-based and very user-friendly. While completing the form, you may notice that some of the questions change. This is because the app uses dynamically displayed questions, meaning that you will only see the questions that you need to answer based on the sign type that you are documenting. The form will also automatically collect the sign's location, and no cellular coverage or internet connectivity is required. Um, as you can see playing in the lower right hand corner here, uh, we've got a quick like a quick preview of what using this app looks like. Um, as you can see, it's cycling through the questions that you answer, as well as it's showing the pictures that give you examples. So, for example, if you don't know what a low profile versus an upright wayside looks like, you can click on a larger picture to help you answer that question. Here, it's uh, so what you're selecting the size of the wayside, and that doesn't need to be exact. You know, you can just use a close approximation. Um, you'll be selecting things like what is the base material, and then importantly, what are the overall conditions? And then what state you're in. And then there's other questions here. Um, date assessed will fill out automatically. That will be the date that you're filling out the form. Um, you can tell us what the land ownership is if you know it. Typically, it's public for these types of signs but it could be private as well. And then lastly, you'll include a um, photo. You'll include one photo that's zoomed out from a large perspective, and then you'll do one that's closer. That just shows specifically the wayside itself and the content. Um, so you'll have the option to send your recording, but you can also save it for later if your signal is really weak and you'll you have a library on the app that will save that for you. Downloading the app is done the same way you download any other app to your device. So that would be iTunes for Apple users, Google Play for Android users. And changes to the password requirements have recently occurred for RPS online partner accounts. Passwords for partners' accounts will have to be changed every 60 days to align with the Department of the Interior's security requirements. Upon logging into the RTS online or the Survey123 app, 
you will be notified when your password needs to be updated. Please make sure to keep track of your password in some manner. So once you are logged into the app, search for the NHT Asset Inventory Group under Download Surveys. Downloading the survey ensures you can access and encode data without the cell service. The screenshot in the middle here shows you uh, what the app will typically look like. Your outbox is where any completed surveys that you have not yet sent will sit until you have adequate cell service. The last image on the right shows the survey itself. As you can see, it's simple and straightforward. Also, uh, please remember to close the application out if there is a lot of time between waysides and recordings. Not only does it use up a lot of your battery power, um, but it, it can use a lot of your uh, your cell phone's like bandwidth through the GPS, meaning you might not be able to do much else if this app is running. So your efforts do not go unnoticed. Uh, we utilize a live dashboard to stay up to date on field collections. Uh, I took this screen graph here on Friday, uh, or sorry, Thursday. And um, as you can see, we currently have 1,048 total waysides and time recordings. Thanks to the efforts of our staff and partners combined. Now, this is the total for all of our NHTs and all of the different partners that we have. Um, as you can see down at the bottom there, we currently have 87 total wayside and sign recordings for the Trail of Tears. And then on the left here, you can see a general overview of what types of signs people are collecting uh, across all of the trail. The majority of them have been um, road and pedestrian signs. Uh, coming in second is interpretive voice signs. So if you all have any questions and comments, um, here's our emails again for you. And again, I'm happy to put those in the chat. Uh, but my name is Chad Ennis. I'm a GIS specialist. It's been great talking to you all. Trying to keep this pretty brief and simple. Um, we definitely don't want you know this to feel intimidating at all. So if you have any questions, um, I can take those now, or um, you guys can reach out to us at a later date. Chad, this is Mike, and, and I will. This is to everybody in the room, really, or people online. This can seem technolog technologically challenging. It's actually easier than what he's told you it is. If I can do this, anybody in the world can do this. Get past the light switch and I get confused. So this is actually really easy. I did. I was in Oklahoma and saw a bunch of the Park Service people out there and just sat and everywhere we went. I did this and it's actually pretty fun. Um, and I would say probably here in Georgia, if you know where there were signs or there should have been signs, uh, one of the early things I said is we don't know where the things are. You know, lots of records have been lost over the years. And so if you know there should be signs somewhere and they're not, you can document it this way and it will help. So. Thank you, Mike. That's a really good question. No. Can I ask, uh, Chad? Um, if we approach uh, a landowner about um, using their property as like an interpretive or a, um, a, a certified site, um, it, is there particular signs that you recommend that um, would be easier to maintain or last longer or um, that so we could uh, persuade the uh, owner to allow something to be put there? That's a good question. I think I would have to defer to our signing, um, our, our staff members who deal directly with signing, mm -hmm. and they actually know a lot of ways to work with landowners um, and, you know, create partnerships like that. And also they know a lot of, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, there's been a lot of updates to what types of signs people will and won't put up because we know certain things just don't last. Um, this app would be more for collecting, you know, like we said, where a where a sign was or still is. Um, if you want to propose a new location for a sign, we can direct you to our staff members that can work with you uh, more directly with that. 
And that would be that would be Corey Donnelly, yeah. by the way. So when you're dealing with roads, yeah. it's either a county or the state or the federal government, depending on what kind of road it is. So you really need to talk to them if if that's so it's there's processes, but there's also different requirements of who approves. And I'll, I'll add that um, our design and development team, and Chad mentioned Corey Donnelly, she leads that team. They have done incredible work with entering into agreements with departments of transportation. Um, and because a lot of times that's where the holdup is, right? There's a lot of requirements for any kind of road signs and um, our design and development team can answer any questions about that. When it comes to interpretive way sites, um, there are lots of options as well. And our interpretive team would be able to work directly with any property owner if they have questions. They're really good about recommending where a wayside should be located, or even if it's appropriate to put up a wayside. You know, if you're not going to get a lot of public out there um, for whatever reasons, then maybe a wayside, a physical wayside is not the best option, but there's great opportunities to develop like digital uh, media content where people can read and learn about the significance of a site without really even having to go to the site. So there's lots of lots of opportunities. And one thing that I'll also say is um, a lot of times, you know, we rely on our partners to let us know what the needs are. And I think we've we've stated that a few times. But, you know, once a year, uh, we uh, formally reach out to the National Trail of Tears Association and ask them to send us to, to work with the, their chapters, collect priority projects for the next you know fiscal year and send those to us. And then we review all those. Like right now we're in the process of reviewing the association's priorities that they sent to us for the next fiscal year, which for us starts October 1. So please, please work with your, um, whoever your chapter representative is to the National Trail of Tears Association. Let them know what the, what your priorities are, and then they can send them to us. You can work with us directly, but that really is something that we encourage you to do. Thank you to the three folks from the Trails Office, especially. Um, this was above and beyond anything I had, had hoped we would able be able to do. So thank the three of you a lot. And look forward to see, hopefully seeing you at, at uh, the National Conference this year. Uh, Sharon or Leslie, do you, either of you want to make some final comments? Yeah, I have some business meetings to go to. Okay. We need to leave. Yeah, so we'll do, we'll do the business meeting. But for online people, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, from our chapter, especially we really want to get back into um, getting our um, sites uh, uh, in line with what you're going, what you're doing. And I really um, appreciate all those little forms. I hope that we can get those from you um, so that we can for our members to go out there and collect that information for you um, on the fly easily because you know uh, i've seen a lot of our past research and we have a lot of stuff down but i'm not sure it's exactly what you needed to get us uh there so we're looking forward to doing that i appreciate it greatly and looking forward to talking to you more